Well, I want to apologize again if you're downstairs. You can hear my voice but not see me, and uh, so it's kind of like just listening to a podcast together. It's like a listening party. Um, we're glad you're here in spite of those technical difficulties. And um, we are coming this morning to one of the most important chapters in the whole Bible, Genesis chapter 15. If you understand what's happening in this chapter, you will understand the storyline of the entire scriptures. And so it's a crucial chapter for us to get our minds around. Uh, As we get into it then, I want to invite you to do a couple of thought exercises with me. I want you to think about a troubled marriage that you know of, uh, where there's animosity and strife and division, and realize that marriage didn't start out that way. That couple had a wedding day. They rented tuxedos and took photos and had a party. Something changed over time. Uh, Likewise, think about someone you know who's walked away from the faith. Someone who perhaps at at one time would have professed to be a Christian, but now they've turned away. Their journey with God didn't start out that way. No one professes faith and gets baptized and joins the church intending to walk away from it all later on. Again, something changed over time. We've got this parenting conference coming up here in a few weeks, and by the way, uh, I hope you'll join us for that. It's one of my favorite things that we do. And as I was getting ready for that this week, I, on my hard drive, found the, the roster, the attendance roster from the very first parenting conference we held back in 2008, 12 years ago. 71 people had signed up for that first conference. Some of those people are in this room right now. Uh, Some have been part of church planting teams that have been sent out from our church. And a few are not walking with Jesus anymore. So 12 years ago, they came to a conference to learn how to to raise kids in ways that honor the Lord. and, And now they themselves are no longer walking with the Lord. And when I look back over that list of names, when I think about those stories, I find myself asking this question. How do I know that's not going to be my story? I mean, life is long, right? And faith in God is a challenge. And every day brings new obstacles. There are a lot of people who have started strong and then faded away. A lot of people whose love for God has grown cold. A lot of people whose faith in Christ has grown stale. How do I know that won't happen to me? How do you know that won't happen to you? How can we know that will make it all the way to the end. Genesis 15 is the Bible's answer to that question. In Genesis 15, we see Abram struggling with doubt, which I appreciate because that's my struggle as well. I realize there are people out there who say, having faith in God means you don't have any doubts. That is simply not the case. And so I find it comforting to go to the page of Scripture and find characters like Abraham, heroes of the faith who also wrestle with doubt and discouragement. Let's look together at Genesis 15. I want you to notice two types of doubt that Abram expresses here. First of all, notice that Abram doubts God. He wonders Is God going to come through for him? Is God going to deliver on what he said he would do? Look at Genesis 15, verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. Now, you might have missed this in the story so far, but this is the first time in the entire narrative that Abraham speaks to God. The first point in the story that Abraham speaks to God, it's to raise a question. In fact, John Stalehammer, who's probably one of the most insightful commentators on the book of Genesis, observes this. Throughout the Genesis narratives, when Abraham speaks, he gives expression to questions that appear to reveal doubt. 
On the other hand, when he is silent, his actions always exhibit faith. So Abram speaks up here, and his speaking expresses doubt about God. Will God come through for him? What is God going to do to come through? But notice a few verses later, Abram also doubts himself. Will he fail God? Look at verses 7 and 8. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of, from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? Abram was saying, do I have what it takes? Will my descendants have what it takes? How can we know that we will possess this land? He doubts God. He doubts himself. And our doubts often fall into these same two categories, don't they? Some of you are more prone to doubt God. You worry that in the end, God will fail you. God will not come through. When when it really comes down to it, he's not going to come through in the ways that he's promised. Others of you are more prone to doubt yourselves. You worry that you will fail God that you don't really have what it takes, that when it comes down to it, you're going to screw it up. So how does God respond to Abraham's doubts? How does God respond to our doubts? The answer we see in Genesis 15 is that God establishes a covenant. Look at uh, verse 4 of Genesis 15. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. So Abram has expressed doubt. He said, God, you've given me no offspring. The very first thing God does is to reiterate his promise. He takes Abram outside. He says, Hey, look at the stars. So shall your descendants be. Friends, when you go outside and when you look at the stars, you should remember this promise that God made to Abram. One of our elders here, Aaron Onyfrock, was telling me about a trip he recently took to the Boundary Waters in northern Minnesota and sharing that there was one night in particular where he got to sleep out under the stars, just wide open with his sleeping bag under the heavens. And he said it was amazing because it's so dark there, you can see everything. And it was a clear night, just full of stars. Every time you get an opportunity like that, every time you get out of the city and you can see the sky and see the stars, I want you to remember, you're looking up at the very same stars that Abraham was. You're trusting the very same God Abraham was. And every time a new church gets planted, every time a new person comes to faith in Jesus, God is fulfilling this promise. So the very first thing God does in response to Abram's doubt is to remind Abram of his promise. But notice it doesn't stop there. It gets even better. Verse 9, God says, Bring me a heifer, three years old, a female goat, three years old, a ram, three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Let me explain what's going on here, because this is sort of an odd scene. Um, Let's use a metaphor. If if you buy or sell a home in Nebraska, you sign a standard document called a Uniform Residential Purchase Agreement. It's the legal template for buying and selling a home in Nebraska. Every residential real estate uh, contract, no matter who the lawyer or uh, broker is who's representing it, follows this same basic template. In a similar manner, in the ancient Near East, when two parties wanted to make a binding agreement, when they wanted to make a covenant, there was a template. There was a pattern. The two parties would take animals and cut them in half. And then they would join hands and walk between those pieces together. And in doing so, they were saying, may I be like these animals if I fail to keep my word. 
So let me read to you from an ancient Assyrian treaty document. This is not the Bible. This is something we have learned from archaeology, uh, something in this place in the world, this time in the world. Uh, here's an example. This head is not the head of a lamb. It is the head of Matilu, his sons, officials, and people. If Matilu sins against this treaty, then just as the head of this lamb is torn off, so may the head of Matilu be torn off and his sons. It's an example of how these treaties worked in the ancient world. Likewise, in Jeremiah chapter 34, God pronounces judgment on his people for breaking covenant with him. And listen to the language of Jeremiah 34. God says, the men who transgressed my covenant and did not keep the terms of the covenant they made before me, I will make them like the calf that they cut in two and passed between its parts. I will give them into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their lives. In a covenant ceremony, then, the two parties would walk between these slain animals, and in doing so, they were taking upon themselves the curse of unfaithfulness. They were saying, if I am unfaithful to this agreement that we're making, then may I be as these animals. So that's the scene that God is setting up with Abraham. But then, something even more amazing happens. Look at verse 17. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. The smoking fire pot and the flaming torch represent the presence of God. So instead of Abram and God together walking through the pieces, God alone passes between the pieces. In other words, God himself is taking responsibility for both sides of the covenant. By passing through the pieces himself, God is pledging to fulfill his side of the covenant. He is saying, Abram, you can be sure about me. Don't doubt. I'm going to fulfill my promises. I'm going to be true to my word. But by not letting Abram pass between the pieces, God is also taking responsibility for Abram's side of the covenant. He's saying, I'm going to fulfill your covenant obligations as well as mine. God is saying to Abram, Abram, I'm going to bless you no matter what. Even if it means being torn limb from limb myself. And only in Jesus Christ does that promise make sense. In Jesus Christ, God has done what he pledged to Abraham that he would do. He himself has been cut off in order to fulfill Abram's side of the covenant. Think about it, friends. When we enter into covenant with God, when we take on the obligations of relationship with God, we are pledging to be faithful to Him, to be loyal to Him. That's what God wants from His people. He wants our trust and our obedience, our fidelity. That's what He wanted from Abraham. That's what He wants from you and me. And as we read the Scriptures, we see that God does, in fact, fulfill His side of the covenant. He gives Abraham what He promised. He gives him both offspring and land. In fact, right here in chapter 15, God gives a little preview of what's going to happen over the next few centuries of redemptive history. Look in verse 13. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, you shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. God is telling Abram what's to come. He's saying, Abram, you're in fact going to have so many offspring that they're going to become a whole nation of people. And a few hundred years from now, I'm going to deliver them from captivity, and they're going to come right back here to this land and inherit it. God fulfilled his part of the promise. 
The problem is, none of Abram's descendants prove to be faithful covenant partners. None of Abram's descendants are loyal to God. In fact, a core metaphor of the Old Testament is that God is a faithful husband and his people are like the bride who keeps running off with other men. This language of covenant infidelity is all throughout the Old Testament. Let me read you a few places. Jeremiah 11, verses 9 through 11. The men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem have gone after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant that I made with their fathers. Hosea 8, verse 1. Set the trumpet to your lips. One like a vulture is over the house of the Lord because... They have transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my law. Jeremiah 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. See, the problem is God is faithful to his people. But his people are not faithful to him. Abraham and all of his descendants fail to keep covenant with God. And so God, in his covenant love, does the very thing he pledges to do in Genesis 15. God, in his covenant love, takes on human flesh and enters into this world as a descendant of Abraham. That's why the genealogies in the beginning of Matthew and Luke matter. You ever wonder when you, when you get to Christmas time and you want to read the Christmas story, you open up to the Gospels and you're like, man, it starts with this long list of names of this person descended from this person who descended from this. What is that all about? It's telling you the Lord Jesus is a descendant of Abraham. He is physically related to and connected to Abraham, and that matters for what Jesus has come to do. Because Jesus has come into the world as a descendant of Abraham and he lives a life of perfect obedience to the covenant, perfect loyalty and faithfulness to God. And then the Lord Jesus Christ goes to the cross and dies. He is cut off. Why? Because he's taking on himself the curse of the covenant. He, as the descendant of Abraham, is bearing the curse of infidelity that Abraham and all his descendants deserve. And so because Jesus fulfills the covenant, those who belong to Jesus, those who trust in him, inherit the promises God has made to Abraham. Listen, one of the major questions of the New Testament, I told you, if you understand Genesis 15, 15, you'll understand the whole Bible. One of the major questions in the New Testament is this. How are Jew and Gentile related? Are you a Jew, a physical descendant of Abraham, an heir of the covenant, or are you a Gentile, an outsider to that family and to the promises God has made to them? And the apostles consistently say, wrong question. That's no longer the question. Here's why. Because there's only one descendant of Abraham who has fulfilled the covenant, the Lord Jesus Christ. He has done what God promised to do in Genesis 15. He has been cut off in place of Abraham, so he inherits the promise God made to Abraham, and he shares that inheritance with everyone who belongs to him, Jew or Gentile. That's the very argument at the heart of the book of Galatians. Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. It says this, Now the promises were made to Abraham, and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is an important verse for your doctrine of the authority of Scripture. Because what the apostle has just done is make a whole theological argument based on the letter S. He's reading his Hebrew Bible and saying, God made some promises to Abraham and to his offspring, and oh, the word there is singular, not plural. So he's not talking about a bunch of people. He's talking about one person. You know who that is? It's Jesus. That's why you got to read your Bible carefully, because the letter S sometimes matters. 
Jesus is the offspring. Jesus is the promised seed. Jesus is the one who inherits the promises made to Abraham. And therefore, Jesus is the one who secures our covenant relationship with God. So, let's go back to where we began. How do we know that we'll make it to the end? Well, there are two ways to think about that. You can know you'll make it to the end because you keep living as a good, faithful Christian. You keep doing the things you need to do, holding up your end of the bargain. The Bible calls that justification by works. Because in the end, what you're trusting in is your work, your faithfulness, your loyalty. And if that's where your trust is, there's no way for you to know for sure that you will, in fact, make it to the end. The Scriptures invite you to place your confidence somewhere else. How do you know you'll make it to the end? Because Jesus has fulfilled the covenant in your place. He has done it all. And in Jesus, God has pledged himself to you unconditionally. He has walked between the slain animals and said, I'm going to hold up my end of the deal and I'm going to hold up your end of the deal. The Bible calls this justification by faith. It's trusting that God has done it all and that our job is just to believe that, to rest in that, to count that as true and place our confidence in that. Which is why Genesis 15, 6 is one of the most important verses in all the Bible. Genesis 15, 6, And Abram believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. What does Abram do in this covenant relationship? Why does God consider Abram a righteous person? Because Abram believes. He takes God at his word. He trusts in God's promise, which is the same thing you and I must do. Jesus has done it all, and we rest in his finished work. So, friends... How do we deal with doubt? We deal with doubt by believing. And I know that sounds funny to you because we think of doubting and believing as opposites. Friends, hear me. They're not opposites. You know what Martin Luther said believing is like? Here's two metaphors that Martin Luther gave for what it means to believe the way Abraham believed. Believing is like the ground soaking up the rain. Believing is like a rock lying in the sun and becoming warm. Believing isn't us doing something. It's resting in what God has done. And so this morning, we're invited to the table of the new covenant. We are invited to come with all of our doubts and all of our questions and all of our fears and all of our uncertainty and all of our confusion. And we come and take God at his word. God doesn't say, hey, resolve all your doubts, get all that figured out, and then come with really strong, vibrant belief. He says, come wherever you are with whatever doubts you have, and take me at my word. Jesus has pledged himself to us. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, he told his disciples. I made a covenant with Abram, and I've come to fulfill that covenant, and now I'm initiating a new covenant, and here it is. It's in my blood. I am the offspring of Abraham who has inherited the promises, and I share them with my people. So take and eat and believe. And we take the bread and the wine 
And we say, we believe. We trust. We take him at his word. This is what it means to deal with doubt. This is what it means to trust the Lord. This is what it means to be in covenant with him. Is to recognize God has done it all in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. Our work is to rest in the work that he has done. So let's pray to that end as we come to the Lord's table. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your gracious promises. We thank you that you in this dramatic moment in redemptive history made it clear to Abraham that you would fulfill your side of the covenant and his as well. And thank you that in Jesus you have done just that. So Father, we ask that we would have the courage to take you at your word this morning. Help us come and rest in the promises you have made and in the work Jesus has done for us. Help us see that what it means for us to be your faithful covenant partners is to rest in the work you have done, to believe and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you awaken a deeper harvest of faith and trust and rest in our souls this morning? And as we come to your table, fill us with hope that you have delivered on your promises and you will continue to do so. We pray this for our good and for your glory. Amen.